Park Garvino, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Portugal, and Dr. S. J. Shankar, Minister of External Affairs, India. Thank you so much for joining us at this discussion. We will be uh, taking questions, and uh, just to let you all know that those who are uh, seeking to ask our panelists uh, some questions, please move, walk to the mics, which are located at multiple locations in the room, and pose your questions. We will collect a bunch and then turn back to uh, uh, the speakers. Uh, do not make your questions into commentaries. Uh, write them for newspapers. Pose a very specific uh, query. Uh, this panel is going to discuss India's evolution as a global actor. Uh, at 75, uh, its dynamic evolution, its uh, role in various issues from climate change to humanitarian crisis uh, to global peace, uh, its development in the technology sector, its pathways that will impact all of you and all of us. Uh, it will also discuss global assessments of where India is, uh, global expectations from India, and uh, perhaps uh, how does India uh, work with its key partners in the days ahead. Uh, to get this started, let me first turn to uh, my friend Jeff Smith. Jeff, India at 75, what does that evoke? What does India at 75 mean for you as a, as a global partner of India, as someone who's been watching India, as someone who's been writing on India? Mm. Thank you, Samir, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. And I will request all the speakers to bring the mic as close to their mouth as possible. Okay. Because the YouTube folks have been craving since yesterday that the audio is bad, so bring it close to you. It's, it's an honor to be on uh, such a distinguished panel. When I think of India at 75, what stands out most to me is that it's become a responsible international actor. You know, international relations theory tells us that when a country so large rises so quickly, Traditionally, it's been a destabilizing phenomenon. And China has in some way proved these realist theorists correct in, in the way it's been acting more belligerently, with more nationalism, uh, aggressive in its territorial disputes. You know, it's fairly remarkable that India has risen the geopolitical hierarchy so quickly. It was the 10th largest military spender in the world in 2009. Today, it's the third. If China had not overshadowed its rise, all we would be talking about is, is how quickly India has risen. And yet it hasn't become a destabilizing international actor. In fact, I would argue it's become more responsible. It's not aggressively seeking to redress historical grievances. It's not bullying its neighbors. It's not seeking to reclaim lost territory. In fact, it's settling its uh, disputes responsibly in international forums. It's being more magnanimous in its neighborhood. Um, it's treating its neighbors more kindly than it had in the past. It is defending the rules-based order. Uh, it's being a good partner to the West. Uh, it's being courted by international capitals across the world. And so, to me, I think th this has been a remarkable phenomenon in the way it has contributed to regional and global stability, and it's something to be applauded. Um, that, to me, is, is the most remarkable thing about India at 75. Jeff, clearly you are in a minority, right? If you open a New York Times newspaper or a Washington Post or any other medium, uh, you see uh, write-ups that uh, could be disturbing, to say the least. Uh, so, what is the assessment? How does India respond to uh, the United States when it sees these multiple messages coming at it? Well, first of all, as someone who works at a conservative think tank, criticism from the New York Times is uh, no surprise, something we're very familiar with. And you have to understand that um, Western criticism, particularly in the liberal media, is not unusual. Uh, but I think it's very important to distinguish between criticism in the free press and government policy. And if you look at U.S. government policy consistently across multiple administrations, bipartisan administrations, two Republicans, two Democrats, they have been consistent in pursuing stronger ties with India. 
uh, most of the criticism, whether it's in the U.S. or internationally, has been of Indian domestic policy. But very few have criticized India's international policy. And everyone wants to do more business with India. I would argue everyone does. The U.S. does, Europe, Africa, Latin America. I would argue even India's rivals want to do more business with India. Even, even China would like to do more business with India, just not on terms that are acceptable to India. And so when you actually look at government policy, India is being courted by a wider number of capitals than perhaps any other country. And sometimes we need to separate the noise in the press from real government policy. Well, you know, let me pose a similar question to you. Sitting in, in Austria, in, in Europe, um, when you say India, what does that really evoke in folks uh, in, in the strategic circles and perhaps even on the street? How is India assessed today? India at 75, uh, what are your expectations? What are, your, what are the attributes that come to mind? And how do you see um, India as a partner? I would start by differentiating between my personal knowledge and my personal perception uh, while dealing with uh, India for such a long time. And of course, then uh, what um, kind of perception Europe uh, has about uh, India, which is obviously also shifting uh, in positive terms. Um, and in general terms, these two last years have brought one positive image, one positive um, story, actually, if I look at the relations between Europe and India. And that is the story, or let's say this watershed moment in the relations, the realization we need to do more in bilateral and in multilateral terms. This was definitely a watershed moment in the understanding about how important India has become for the global order, for the so-called rules-based order that the European Union and the European member states actually uh, want to see strengthened. And also there is this realization on the side of European decision makers, uh, both uh, in the institutions and in the member states, that uh, uh, both Europe and India do not want to be caught in a binary world given the deepening systemic competition between the United States and China, there may be a third way for Europe and India. A third way would mean equidistance, would mean that uh, you know, both could actually build uh, uh, an own uh, center of uh, trading power and could actually have an own story to tell. Now, when it comes to my personal understanding, I also have witnessed a huge development in positive terms. Um, just if I think about uh, the beginning of 2000, there was no real interest uh, in India, more or less. Uh, there were, of course, uh, uh, scholars and exchanges, uh, student programs, but as a young student um, dealing with South Asia and with India, um, actually, I was quite frustrated that uh, the um, political elites were not really interested in deepening the relations. This has definitely changed. Change. When it comes to people-to-people to people relations, I think that uh, both share a very similar positive perception about each other, and this is going to grow further. Willin, I'll, I'll come back to you with another question. Um, uh, to look ahead, and I'll come back to you. But let me now turn to Prime Minister Harper. So two years ago, uh, on this very stage, you had um, made a bold statement that India is going to define itself. I India is beginning to define its own role, its own place. Uh, its government is beginning to carve a unique identity. And you had mentioned this at this very stage. Uh, two years on, the pandemic uh, and the various political developments how would you assess India's role now and India's uh, contributions over the challenges that have uh, occurred or we have faced together or, 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 in, or in groups? Uh, look, I, I think I would um, stick with the statement I made a couple of years ago that um, you know, India is defining itself. And I, I think that 
India's definition in the world is increasingly shaped by uh, the nature of India itself. Um, you know, if you look at all um, dimensions of foreign policy, um, India, as other panelists have discussed, India has had a remarkable economic transformation and growth now for a large number of years. And it is becoming an increasing player in global trade on the world stage. Um, to some degree, obviously, in, in the medical issues we had during, during uh, COVID. And uh, for that reason, you know, it's, it's increasingly relevant to investors, uh, to business people around the world. Um, likewise, um, the nature of India as a free and democratic society uh, is, I think, starting to more dramatically shape its alliances and relationships than would have been the case 20, 30 years ago. And, and finally, um, you know, on the security front, uh, and this is where I think India is to some degree, like all of us, India is, is to some degree not just shaping its own destiny, but being shaped by the world around us. As China rises, as Jeff said, as a disruptive power, um, that seems to me to be pushing India towards a series of security alliances, the Quad, others, that are very different than the past and I think make a lot of sense for India in the future. Could I just maybe say one other thing, um, uh, uh, Samir, and, uh, kind of along the lines of what you asked, uh, uh, Jeff, I do want to comment on this. Uh, you're mentioning about how India is reported in certain Western uh, liberal left, center-left media. I think it's important for people to realize uh, in the Western center-left media, uh, when India is being talked about, it's only being talked about as a proxy for domestic political commentary. Hmm. Um, you know, the attacks on India, which you do see, and you see it in similar Canadian media, British media, uh, these are just attacks on conservatives. Hmm. Um, they, are, they are not really about India. Hmm. Um, and it's not that they should be ignored, um, but it is, you know, essential, obviously, that we correct the record and make sure that people understand that these are not reports about India. They are simply editorials about disagreements, philosophical disagreements that those newspapers have with conservatives in their own countries. Mm. So it's an internal debate with an instrument that's outside the country. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Hopper, one more question to you. You are quite categorical that it is not going to be a Western-styled, liberal, plural country. You said this two years ago. Uh, would you, however, agree that we are being still judged by that framework? So while you have said we are not going to be uh, like the Atlantic uh, order, yet we are being evaluated through the same order. Uh, uh, at least in the public sphere, I don't know how the elites in, in that part of the world assess us. Look, I, th I think there's some truth. I think there's some truth in that, and and obviously, to some degree, it's it's unfair because India's orientation, for some national interest reasons, will be fundamentally different. Um, and you know, I do think that you know, let's talk frankly about the Ukraine-Russia conflict and some of the controversy in the West around uh, around India's position on that. I think it falls into two categories. I think where, where there's some fairness, if I can be blunt, in some of the critique, that's really around the concern that Russia's actions go beyond an attack on liberal democratic frameworks. The idea that a country could just obliterate its border, the borders of its neighbors and absorb them, I think is a threat to the international order, whether uh, you are a demo liberal democratic society or not. Uh, but I do think in a lot of commentary uh, beyond that, you know, in terms of energy, in terms of um, military relationships, in terms of is India's national interests, I think there's also um, a misunderstanding of the fact that India's alignments are, are in fact not always identical with Western countries. Okay. So, uh, uh, Minister Carvino, let me, uh, first of all, welcome back to Delhi and, and uh, you as much a native of Delhi as you are of uh, Porto. But let me... Uh, ask your question, sir. Uh, and it would be fair to say that the current Prime Minister, the External Affairs Minister, have uh, invested more in that continent than perhaps India has ever done. More visits. Uh, we had the Porto Summit hosted by uh, your government. 
uh, we have, of course, announced this new arrangement, uh, Technology uh, and Trade Arrangement Commission, uh, uh, two days ago. Um, in your uh, view, how do you see uh, India and Europe working together, of course, in the matters of politics around the Indo-Pacific and, and associated regions, but also in uh, uh, the digital domain, which is today the new theater of economics, politics, geopolitics, and of course, even war and peace. So how do we, how do, what is your assessment of our journey in these two domains now and in the future? Well, thank you very much, uh, Samir, and thanks for the invita invitation to be here. It's so you have to bring the mic closer to you. It's wonderful to be uh, back in Delhi. Well, I think that uh, the answer to that, the answer that I would like to develop to that is much related to various of the earlier points that have been raised about India at uh, 75. I think that uh, one of the major differences that I'm feeling back here in Delhi from uh, in relation to the period a uh, decade or so ago when I lived here uh, is India's availability now not only to have an enormous impact upon the world which is related to its, its sheer scale, its population, its growth, but its availability to shape the world that we're living in as well and its consciousness about the need to do so. And I read with great uh, interest uh, uh, Minister Jay Shankar's book, the, the India Way, in which, uh, in page after page, this availability and this consciousness comes through, that uh, India has uh, not only the capacity to impact upon the world, but actually it needs to do so. And what this means, uh, I believe, is that India is thinking deeply about the kind of uh, international governance that it can contribute to. And when we look at issues such as uh, the increased proximity, you're absolutely right, there has never been such uh, proximity between India and the European Union as we, we feel now. Um, it is related to an awareness that we have between those two entities, India and the European Union, a, sh a series of uh, commonalities that uh, are of relevance to the way that we look at the world and to the world that we would like to help shape. So connectivity issues, digitalization, the establishment of uh, common norms, a platform of understanding about the uh, flow of information that we need in, in the world that, we're, uh, that we're, we're building. And at the same time, a sense of urgency that results from the very clearly broken nature of globalization that we're facing at the moment. And the Russian invasion of Ukraine has illustrated this in a very profound manner, and it has an impact, as Prime Minister Harper mentions, not only upon the borders of Ukraine, but upon uh, global geopolitics, including, including in the Indo-Pacific region. So I think that it is a, a very natural approach from India to reach out and to say, hang on, who are the partners internationally with whom we can work in order to help to shape the world that, uh, that, we, that conditions our, our lives and the lives of our peoples? And, and, and Mr. And Minister, uh, I want to ask you a direct question. The question is that many of us feel that we have made a clear decision in favor of the EU. We are bet on EU. Uh, and this is not as an insider, this is as an outsider who sees statements coming out from our leaders. We feel India has <clears throat> put all its uh, force, political capital and resources to build a strong, powerful partnership with the EU. Does EU feel the same? I, well, I think that one of the perhaps uh, unintended effects uh, from uh, relating to Putin's invasion of the Ukraine is that it has stimulated very powerfully Europe's uh, need to think and act strategically. And this makes the European Union a more interesting partner for uh, India and for, for others around the globe. And I, I think that uh, when we look at the kind of issues that are relevant for the European Union, and you, you mentioned earlier the digitalization and the way that we, the way that we structure um, our international interactions, I think that uh, now that in Europe there is a very clear consciousness that we need to relate our international interactions, we need to balance them with strategic trust. Of course, from a European perspective then, India is a very attractive partner. We can strategically trust India, uh, whereas uh, I think that the kind of globalization that was a little bit blind to strategic trust 
that we had uh, previously is now being rethought deeply. And uh, in that sense, India emerges from a European perspective as an increasingly relevant, important uh, partner. So it's a positive development, uh, I think, and uh, certainly unintended from Russia's uh, perspective, but, uh, but one that it bodes very well for the future of India-European relations and for the contribution that they jointly can make uh, to a, an international governance that is rules-based uh, based on a common sense of, of uh, international decency and predictability in our behavior towards each other. Melina, would you like to jump in on that? I would actually agree with uh, the view shared by the minister, and of course I would like to stress that probably it's not really um, common knowledge how much was achieved in the last two years. The very fact that the European Union, which is now also striving for uh, becoming a geopolitical actor, uh, the European Union as a collective actor is in fact not a geopolitical actor yet. This is something that we have to also uh, state uh, very openly, but it wants to learn the language of power. And if it wants to learn the language uh, of power, it needs to also deal with the major great powers. And in this sense, of course, it has a significant geoeconomic clout that it can use. So this is something that can be helpful to India. However, we also have to understand that, uh, and we have to accept that India has its own geopolitical interests, its own geoeconomic interests, and it has, uh, of course, much broader agenda of alliances and uh, partnerships. And here, for instance, uh, there is this um, misunderstanding in Europe when it comes to uh, the approach to Russia. Now, in our case, in the European case, we also have a different approach to China. That would mean uh, one that is not being shared by India. Uh, the very fact that we have deepened relations uh, with uh, China significantly in the geoeconomic uh, domain and have helped China become this significant second system uh, poll, um, this is something that India certainly does not share. So in a sense, we have to also develop an understanding while deepening the relationship, the institutional one, uh, and here I argue that we really need FTA, a free trade agreement that needs to be signed as quickly as possible, uh, adopted as quickly as possible. We cannot lose another 10 years in negotiations. This is something that both will benefit from, but at the very same time, we also have to uh, develop an understanding for each other's uh, different geopolitical interests. Thank you. Let me, uh, before I turn to the external affairs minister, Jeff, very quickly, how are the how are the two countries looking at the future? How do where are the points of disagreement and friction, uh, and your assessment of the opportunities of the next few years? And then I'll turn to the external affairs minister, Jeff. First of all, I think we've done a much better job um, in recent years navigating differences, and I think uh, Ukraine issue has been a prominent example of that. Something that in the past may have caused legitimate discord in the relationship uh, is an issue that we've uh, managed our differences quite well, uh, as evidenced by the 2 plus 2 dialogue just a few weeks ago. Minister Jaishankar was in Washington. I think we handled those differences with maturity, and I think the U.S. understands India's perspective better than it used to, and it understands that, um, as Minister Jaishankar said years ago, you know, sometimes India doesn't take sides, it takes its own side. And that's okay. That's what the Indian government elect, or that's what the Indian people elected the government to do, is to take India's side. But the beauty of it is that our interests are often in alignment. And so India's side uh, often is the same as the US and Europe on these issues. But it's incumbent on us to demonstrate why it's in India's interests to cooperate on issues, not tell them and lecture them why it's in their interest, but demonstrate why we have common interests and pursue ways to operationalize those interests. I think we've come a long way in that regard. Mr. Minister, let me turn to you. So I thought maybe we could use this opportunity for you to disclose some of your private meetings with the leaders you meet during your visit. You don't have to name them. You can just give us some anecdotes. I mean, and, and let, me, let me kind of frame it. Maybe you can tell us uh, 
as you travel through uh, the various uh, countries that you visit, what is the most uh, often heard uh, criticism or complaint or, uh, or maybe uh, a curi curious question that you hear that, that, they, that befuddles them in terms of our actions? And also, perhaps, a, a flavor of um, uh, what they want from you. What is their expectation from you? So I think a mix of both, that, that what befuddles them and what excites them about your visit, when you go and visit them or when our prime minister visits them. Um, if you disclose names, it will be good, but also without names, it will be fine. Thank you. Uh, I would uh, give you a more analytical and probably more detached answer than you are expecting. Uh, so look, uh, when we are looking at India at 75, it's not just India at 75, we're also looking at another 25 years ahead. You know, what have we done? Where have we fallen short? What do we want to do? Because those are often the conversations we have uh, when we go out. If I were to pick a single thing we've done, a difference we've made to the world in the last 75 years, it is the fact that we are a democracy. Uh, if today there's a sense in the world that, you know, for all the, the ups and downs of history, what's happening in different geographies, but somehow in all of us there is that gut sense that democracy is in some form the future. A large part of it is due to the choices that India made and choices that India stuck with in very difficult situations. And there was a time when in this part of the world we were pretty much the only democracy. So if democracy is global today, or we see it as global today, I think in some measure that credit is due to India. Now, it's also fair when we look back at 75 years, we should reflect on where we have come up short. Uh, and I would say the two, three areas which are quite obvious. Uh, one, uh, clearly we didn't pay the kind of attention uh, to, uh, to our social indicators our human resources, as we should have. Uh, two, we didn't concentrate as much on manufacturing and, uh, you know, technology strengths as we should have. And three, in, in terms of foreign policy, probably in the, in the mix of various elements, uh, we didn't give as much importance, as much weight to hard security as we should have. And I say this because, uh, you know, this is not a a polemical criticism of the past. Other countries who were in similar situations did exactly this, and which is one of the reasons why some of them are today ahead. Uh, and uh, it is something we are trying to do now. I mean, these are exactly the areas we are trying to correct at this point of time. So it's not that it can't be done. It is being done even as we speak. So what is it I think we should be doing in the future? Uh, one, I would say most of all to me, the next 25 years is about capability, capability and capability in every possible domain, in every possible way. Uh, we should be completely fixated on outcomes. We should be utterly practical uh, about how we uh, leverage the international environment. So a lot of the conversations which uh, we have when we go abroad is about capability building. Uh, the second is, uh, and that goes back to some remarks you made about uh, how we are perceived. Look, we have to be confident about who we are. I, I, I think it's better to engage the world on the basis of who we are rather than try and please the world as a pay limitation of what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea that others define us, that you know, somewhere there we need to get approval, uh, of uh, other quarters. I think that's an era we need to put behind us. Uh, and definitely, I would hope in the next 25 years, uh, we will be even more deeply uh, international uh, in terms of our uh, commitments, in terms of our responsibilities, in terms of our role uh, than we are. And uh, since you are asking me, so all these conversations, uh, uh, you know, say something which is of interest. Uh, I must say my morning was made today by meeting a fellow foreign minister who told me that Gujarat is ahead of globalization. Uh, 
so uh, actually he said Gujarat doesn't need globalization they're already out there I, I think in a way I would hope in the next 25 years uh, India too uh, is actually at the forefront of a kind of a right kind of globalization more decentralized mm -hmm. uh, more fair uh, more, you know one which works for uh, everybody and one which is not leverage which is not weaponized so let me ask you let's flip this question mm -hmm. What do we expect from the world? We have some key partners, we are diving into certain key relationships, whether it's the EU, whether it's uh, the US, whether it's our uh, big investments in, into all political and economic investments into Africa. What are we seeking from the world as we move to the capacity, capacity, capacity stage of our next 25 years? Well, I think uh, I would uh, look at it, I think I'll tell you what we should not be doing. We shouldn't be looking at the world with a sense of entitlement. Hmm. You know, we should be, we need to earn our place uh, in the world. Uh, and which to a certain extent would therefore come uh, to the issue of how does the world benefit by the growth of India. We need to demonstrate that. Hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, I think today uh, when, you know, there's a lot of talk about reliable, resilient supply chains, when people speak about transparency and trusted technologies, uh, if India could uh, do more and show the rest of the world that the world benefits by India being bigger. So we need to develop stakes in our, in our future where the rest of the world is concerned. I think some of that is happening. Some of that is happening for strategic reasons, obviously. Uh, but we need to ha make more of it happen, especially for economic reasons. Prime Minister Harper, would you like to come in uh, on, on something that the minister said? Would you, would you have well, a comment? I, there's, there's one comment I think really needs to be made, and that is to reflect. Because the minister rightly reflected on some things India can do better in the future. But I, I think we should take a moment at 75 to reflect on what a relative success India actually is. Now, if you look at all of the countries that emerged from colonialism in the post-war period, um, and you focused on their various vulnerabilities, strengths and weaknesses, you would look at India and you would say, look at this country of just enormous cleavages, regional, religious, linguistic, social, cultural, um, and with enormous social and economic challenges, and here we are 75 years later, and of, you know, of all the countries that have emerged from that past, there are very few that have demonstrated the unity, the um, high levels of governance, um, the advancement of human rights and democracy, the economic advancement, the eradication of, of hunger, um, so, look, I just, I, I think that we, we need to, obviously need to reflect on what, what India can do better or different, but it is a remarkable success mm. story. And, and compared to other countries that, that objectively should have been way ahead of India, India is ahead of just about all of them. Mm. So we are going to open it up to all of you. I would request you to walk to the mic and pose your question. My young fellows, especially the Vaisina young fellows, the officer trainees, I would, I, I would want to see some young voices come into this conversation as well. Uh, but till they do, till they um, come to the mic, why don't you go ahead? We'll take, a, we'll take a bunch of questions, okay? Do introduce yourself and short questions, no commentaries. Okay. Thank you very go ahead. Much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hai Quen from Tel Aviv University, Israel. Uh, my question is to uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, India. You spoke about self-confidence. Uh, we uh, really appreciate, I mean, we really are aware of the fact that India is, a very lar is the largest democracy in the world and it is the rising power. So my question is to you is regarding what are your plans for turning India into a permanent uh, member, uh, in the, into a permanent member of the UN Security Council? Thank you. Um, there are two questions on that end. Please go ahead, there are young fellows. Thanks, uh, thanks Samir. Uh, my question is also to... What's the, your name? Introduce yourself. My, so my name is Mohammed. Uh, I am uh, from Egypt and I am with the uh, Raisina Young Fellows. So my question is to the, uh, His Excellency the uh, Minister of India, Mr. Jai Shankar. 
Uh, you mentioned yesterday the efforts of India to uh, increase the food supply and increase the production of wheat. So uh, could you please elaborate on that? And, and, and the next question, please. Yeah, just come. Uh, you're gonna get go ahead. <laughs> yeah, but please go ahead. Please. Okay. Esther. Um, yeah. Thank you, Samir. Uh, my name is Esther. I'm from Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia. Uh, my question is to uh, Your Excellency Minister Jai Shankar. Earlier you said that uh, in the future India should be confident uh, and that it should define itself based on what it thinks of itself, not what the world uh, thinks of itself. Um, just today there's an article released in Foreign Affairs by Dr. Shashi Tharoor saying that India should uh, be clear on its stance on Ukraine and I quote, an idea that equivocated on Ukraine cannot blame others for responding with the same indifference if China decided to teach it a lesson He's and we go the right Shashi is sitting right here. Yes. So, so I, I'm wondering what are your thoughts about this? Because Indonesia is in uh, a way in the same sense in India. Uh, we don't want to uh, choose sides, but at the same time, uh, we have this big question of neutrality um, and many others. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and final question here. Uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm no, no, no. Uh, the, the, the one in front, sir, please. Okay. Go ahead. Ali I'll come to you. I'll come to you. Let's uh, take the. Ali Miftahi, Deputy Chief of Muslim uh, Embassy of Tunisia. Uh, my question is to Dr. Jai Shankar. It's quite simple. Uh, you are saying that 75 years of independence of India is about what have been achieved so far. My question is, uh, and what you are looking to do for the next 25 years. How do you see the uh, Indo-Pacific region and the world uh, for the next 25 years? This is for Dr. Jai Shankar all for, and uh, for all the panelists. Thank Listen, you very much. I, I, I'm going to convert the question for all of them because it's only coming. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. wait, 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 wait. The gentleman there and no more questions. Last question there. We, have, we are running out of... Yep, please uh, go this ahead. is Vijay Kant from Kathmandu. I have a question to External Affairs Minister Dr. Jai Shankar. Uh, when India was independent, it has created a democratic movement in all other South Asian countries. What you were looking for during the more 25 years as a democratic institutions and what India has looking to bilateral relations and multilateral relations with other South Asian countries. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll take you. Go ahead. Patrick. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Patrick Kugel, I'm from the Polish Institute of International Affairs in Warsaw, Poland. I have a question to His Excellency Minister Jai Shankar. Uh, in your book, The India Way, uh, you, you wrote that India must be more ready and willing to take a risk in international affairs and to, uh, that India will be more uh, decider, shaper rather than abstainer. But yet, uh, for the last uh, two months, India abstained at least 11 times at the different forums at the UN uh, on different resolutions uh, concerning Russian aggression against Ukraine. So my question is, wasn't that a good moment actually to take a risk and to have a more principled position, not to abstain, but, but to, to, to... Question say, is, uh, what is the question? I got the question. You got the question. Okay. Thank you very so much. So it is taking and, and the abstention. I think that's the question. Uh, and, and your book, by the way, is featured in most of the questions. The India way. So I, I'll start with you, and then I'll, I'll go down. Yeah, yes, I, I think people shouldn't just pick on me. Uh, so uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's sort of broaden it out. Uh, but look, let me give very quick replies, because I know the clock is ticking. It's, you know, on the Security Council, we have our plan. The problem is we need to have other people to have a plan which is similar to our plan. Correct. Uh, so, uh, on the wheat, I, I answered it yesterday, which was, you know, we have a significant wheat production. We would obviously like to go into the global markets and try to uh, uh, compensate for the shortfalls as much as we can. Uh, in fact, in respect of Egypt, because that's where the question came from, uh, it's one of the countries with whom uh, we, are, uh, we are talking. There were two Ukraine issues, one relating to Shashi's article, and in fairness, I haven't read it, but she was going, to, going through it at a high speed, which was too fast for me. Uh, uh, but Shashi also wrote it at high speed. Yes, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, uh, I'm not sure I would understand it very much better after reading it either. Uh, but uh, the, look, the, here's the point. 
uh, and, and it goes to the last question. Uh, I, you know, we spent a lot of time yesterday uh, on Ukraine, uh, and I've tried to explain uh, what our views are, but also explain that to our, to our, uh, in our minds, the best way forward is to focus on stopping the fighting, getting the talking, and finding ways of moving forward. And we think our, uh, our, you know, our choices, our uh, positions are best placed to advance that. Uh, the question uh, which I had about, you know, where are you going to go 25 years from now? I think more or less I answered that, that, you know, we think more international, we think stronger capability, we think more relevance to the world, and obviously to the Indo-Pacific as well. And the, and the question which the, uh, the person from Nepal asked uh, on South Asia, that in a sense, 75 years, uh, there's more democracy in South Asia than there was 75 years ago. Uh, where will we be 25 years from now? I would say probably the shortest, uh, most truthful answer to that would be we would like to see more prosperity uh, in South Asia. That if India has been, in a sense, an example of democracy or a promoter of democracy in South Asia, we would now like to be part of a larger lifting tide uh, so that you know the rest of South Asia grows uh, along with us. Um, Final words from the rest of the panelists. We want to come in on anything that you heard. You have some thoughts on his responses or what you heard as questions. Uh, Jeff, would you like to come in? Short honest, answer. I, I don't think I, I understood a single question that was asked from the audience. It okay. was very garbled. Um, but no, this has been a, um, a great opportunity to reflect back on India at 75. Samir, I want to give you and the ORF team credit for putting together another fantastic international conference in in a challenging environment, frankly. Um, it's been a great honor to share the panel with these uh, esteemed guests. I've, I've learned a great deal, and I look forward to returning again. Minister Cravino? Well, I think that one of the things that is uh, comforting from a uh, European perspective is uh, that to hear, here in India, that the next few decades are not necessarily reduced to a story of bipolarity between the US and China. There's a lot more happening out there, mm -hmm. and uh, India has a very major role to play, which we welcome. We welcome greatly, and we believe that uh, linkages between Europe and uh, India can be a strong part of that. So I'm very pleased coming back to Delhi. Um, Samir, uh, you diplomatically uh, pointed out earlier that we in the West have a tendency to tell other people what they should do. Um, I think in this case I'll, I'll say that the Indian foreign minister's answers are probably the best answers on Indian foreign policy, so I'll let them stand. Yeah. And Velina, final words to you. Uh, both Europe and India do not want to see an emergence of a second Cold War. Uh, they do not want uh, to see a bifurcation of the global system, and we have a story to tell together. And that means, of course, a story that is different, that does not necessarily mean alliances in this Cold War understanding, um, which is why uh, if there is one development, a geopolitical development that I'm really optimistic about, it is the relationship between Europe and India. Capabilities, capabilities, capabilities. We can deliver on that as well. So there is definitely a shared interest. And I also want to say once again, because I think that there is a lack of, of understanding about the great potential of India in the West, not only in Europe, but also uh, to some extent in the United States. I think that, and I will say something very provoking at the end, the West in fact needs India more when facing the rise of uh, China and the uh, imperiled global order how to repair this imperiled border, then India needs, uh, in fact, uh, the West when facing China in South mm. Asia. So in fact, in this particular case, we have to also develop an understanding for national interests, for geopolitical choices, and we have to find these avenues for cooperation instead of actually uh, aggravating each other uh, because of some other choices that we do not share. Mr. Minister, final words. 
<clears throat> I mostly agree with what everybody said, and uh, not out of courtesy, but really out of a genuine uh, belief. I think India, EU, I mean, no disrespect to anybody else, including Canada, uh, but uh, I really think India, EU, uh, because this has been very much a session with uh, EU at the focus, beginning with the keynote, uh, the India-EU partnership needs more attention, needs more work, needs more commitment, and needs to get a higher profile. Great. So please join me in applauding this wonderful discussion and the wonderful panelists. And uh, uh, remain seated. We will have India's uh, Environment Minister joining us uh, to, to speak about India's um, green transitions. And uh, again, thank you very much, sirs, for coming to Delhi and for joining us at the Raisi Nadaibu. Thank you.